Hi there, and welcome to the Creative Operations Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Groom, and in this podcast, we'll be talking with creative operations leaders in all kinds of industries, from franchising to finance, from healthcare to hospitality and beyond. We'll be looking to uncover best practices and to see trends that are coming to help you keep your creative operations on brand and on budget at the same time. Enjoy. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of the Creative Operations Podcast 2.0. I am really pleased today to have with us Troy Sacco. He's the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Five Star Parks and Attractions. And a, a really interesting story because these guys are growing uh, at an impressive clip. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how that kind of growth and that kind of complexity at the local level can really put some pressures on the creative operations discipline inside of a brand. So, Troy, thanks for joining us. We're really pleased to have you. Absolutely. Great to be on. Absolutely. So the audience always loves to hear a little bit about how you got into this uh, this business of creative operations in the first place, branding, creative operations, strategy, the whole nine yards, um, before we dive into you know specific things that are going on for you at Five Star. So tell us a little bit about how you got here. Yeah, sure. No, no worries. I, I grew up in uh, Syracuse, New York, went to college in Kansas, Emporia State University, and um, wanted to be a teacher and a coach my whole life. I actually got my degree in education, physical education and health. And um, so I have a real passion with teaching and coaching and, and mentoring. And when I went down to Texas, I taught for a year. And in the summertime, I took a job selling advertising inside the stadiums for the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, NCAA, et cetera. And um, ended up, unfortunately, making more money in one summer than I did almost the whole year <laughs> teaching, um, which is, you know, not the intent by any means. I was just trying to earn some extra money. But so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll do this for a while and see how it goes. Um, and so I, I started down the path of sales and marketing uh, pretty early on in my career after college with always the notion of wanting to teach, coach and mentor at some point. And so I met a really great mentor of mine about two or three years into my career. And they said that um, I can do the, the teaching and coaching and mentoring and leadership portion of what my passion is in the sales and marketing world. But I have to dramatically change my my approach and so uh, focus more on. The, um, the education components and leadership classes and human psychology, getting everything I could get my hands on relative to those items and, um, and start to really uh, gear my path uh, in a different direction. So I um, was very fortunate, worked for some great brands early on in a sales leadership role, um, Dave & Buster's uh, main event, Club Corp. Uh, but it wasn't until I got to American Golf where I was able to take on the marketing component as well. And so anytime that a sales individual or sales leader has the opportunity to have a little bit more brand control of the marketing component of what they're selling, um, it makes for a really unique and very powerful role within the company. Um, and learning how to work within interdepartmental folks and, and really take advantage of all the resources so that the vision of what you're trying to sell can also match marketing all under one kind of umbrella. And, um, and so that's once I once I found that was an effective way to, to go about it, I really started to focus on making a career out of sales and marketing, both versus just sales or just marketing. So. Well, that's really neat. And, you know, the theme of mentoring and education is uh, is just, uh, I think, under discussed, you know, especially in our field. Um, we we often think of our systems as trying to distribute not just marketing materials, but marketing intelligence, you know, and marketing um, awareness, I guess you might say, or sensitivity. And it sounds like you in the coaching mode and the and the, the educational mode have to have to do that. So at five at five star, you guys are going from twenty five locations, each its own kind of brand operation unto itself. Yeah. And growing into the forties, as I understand it, that's a lot of growth. So how do you how do you apply that coaching methodology when your team is getting bigger at such a rapid clip? Yeah, for sure. That's a really great uh, way to look at it. So the um, the opportunity is really about hiring the right folks uh, at the beginning. And so we go through a really uh, incredible process where we find out the inspiration of the individual and the DNA of the individual. We go through a lot of that stuff in the interview process. And as we're uh, acquiring brands and bringing them into the family, really trying to figure out. Um, what the DNA of the people are and what are they inspired by. And so um, when you do that and you have the right folks on the team, uh, what I've found is that you you deal less with, oh, this person's personality or that person's viewpoint on things because we're all headed in the same direction, right? And so 
well, you want to be able to teach, coach, and mentor the individual components of the people on your team. The big rocks, the big things you work with every day um, are not that different from your teammate next door, right? And so um, we really try to focus on hiring uh, like-minded individuals. I know that sounds cliche, but um, that's really true. Um, I have this um, motto. It's a life motto. I learned a long time ago from my grandfather, which is you cannot motivate anyone. You can only inspire a motivated person. And so um, I, we just focus on hiring really motivated humans um, that want to achieve the same goals that we do. And um, we find that works out really well. You're making me think of, uh, I've been binging Ted Lasso, you know, to catch up. Uh, and uh, it's a it's a great show. It's a really positive show, you know, that that I think talks about those those intangible elements. And and we spend a lot of time, you know, and our system is a very pragmatic kind of tool that does very mechanical things. But I think the notion that any tool in the hands of a motivated person is going to move a lot further. You know, that notion that the, the person themselves is the force multiplier effect is is, you know, undeniable. So, you know, given that, you know, when, when you, again, just to go back to this notion of uh, a rapidly growing uh, community, do you find yourself um, reaching a point where with all these motivated people, you do need to put sort of structures and roles and, and uh, rules in place that you didn't have when you were smaller? Are you guys hitting sort of pivot points in your growth path? Yeah, for sure. That's a, you know, it's interesting because we're not growing like a traditional organization grows where uh, we're brick and mortar and we build the same brand over and over again. You know, you, you take the main events of the world or the Dave and Busters of the world and the same logos on every building that they build. Um, and we're acquiring brands that have individual histories, um, sometimes long standing histories in the community and, and folks that have been there for 20 years. And we're not changing the brand component. We're bringing in operational marketing and sales. Uh, plug and play opportunities. So um, it's interesting because we have to be able to take what they're currently doing and try to apply something that um, what I call repeatable, predictable, measurable, and traceable. And if it's not one of those four things, we we try not to do it, right? Um, we're trying to take the individual personality-based success models out so that they can be replicatable as we grow. And, um, and so it is challenging because we have... Um, we essentially have multiple brands that we're promoting, which in a normal environment, a normal vice president of marketing or, or VP of sales, they have one brand they're focused on social, uh, pay-per-click, SEO, all of those things. And we're doing that for multiple brands, seven, eight brands. And every brand that we acquire, it's the same challenge, but for a different brand. Nothing is the same every time. So Yeah, yeah, it must be hard to, to I mean, I, I think of it almost from a venture capitalist point of view, right? They're, they're always looking for economies of scale. And yet the authenticity that you guys are, you know, latching on to when you get that established uh, location, that venue that's got a longstanding history in the community, there's, there's scalability in that, but it's a different kind of scalability than we tend to think of, right, in this web-enabled and one-size-fits-all kind of world. So so do you guys kind of set up a, a, a brand methodology that's consistent, but gets populated with different assets, different voice, different essence? Is that kind of how it works? Yeah, correct. So, you know, if, if you go to the five star uh, website and you go to the individual brands, they look very unique and very different, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, we, we, we're trying to put a model in place. We have a great vice president of marketing, Julie Wilson. Um, we have great uh, PR and communication director, and Victoria Boswan and Bethany Rose, our marketing director, David Hatton. And, and so they have processes that are very formulated, but within each of those, they flex with each of the formulations. Um, and so it allows us to be able to deliver uh, an Instagram post across all of our brands on the same day, but they look and feel very different, even though the message may be the same. And so um, it, it is difficult. It's not easy by any means, but um, we, we're starting to develop this formulated approach to it so that Every time we bring on a brand, we say, okay, how does this brand fit into the formula that we are doing every single month for all the other brands? And I'll be honest with you, some things don't work all the time. Sometimes we have to pull things out. If we're in a community that, from a demographic standpoint, you know, doesn't respond well to um, you know, day of, week of offers, right? They're more of a long play offer. Okay, well, we have to change what we're doing there. It doesn't change the formula. It just changes how we how we implement it. You know, it's so interesting, I, I, not to go back to Ted Lasso or anything, but it almost feels to me like Five Star is a league and these brands are teams within the league. They all have their own message, but together 
they make a promise to all of us. You're going to have a, you know, you're going to have a great experience. You're going to have a great thing to follow. You're going to, and everybody is obeying rules that we all honor. That to me is the balance you seem to be striking. And I think, you know, the NFL and the NBA and, 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 you know, uh, Premier League, they've all done a pretty darn good job of that. And it feels to me very similar. Yeah, no, you, uh, that's a really great way to, to bring it all together because that is exactly what happens. Um, we have an unbelievable CEO, John Dunlap, our COO, Wes Marks industry um, icons in a lot of ways um, at SeaWorld and then at Main Event. And so their whole premise is to um, to bring the best, most talented people into our organization at the corporate level so that when we are bringing on these brands, uh, they're being supported by people that have great industry knowledge, great historical knowledge, and then the technical uh, abilities to adapt. And so you're not trying to square peg and round hole anything, which is why I think it works. Um, you know, to be honest, uh, one of the one of the great things that I take a ton of pride in is the continuing education. So, you know, subscribing to an unbelievable um, uh, newsletter called The Hustle. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every single day things come out, staying on top of things. Inc. Magazine is another really big one, um, you know, that, that you've got to subscribe to. You have to understand uh, times are changing. And so as you bring on brands, there may be things that um, they bring to the table in terms of challenges that the traditional formula that I just talked about may not solve. And so we have to be on the front end of being able to provide value to these new brands too. It doesn't do us any good to take a brand over and then say, well, there's no way for us to help you get better, right? So we've got to continue to think about those things. I got I got a question for you. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about um, uh, so much of uh, professional sports leagues, you know, is often watching the, uh, the business aspect as players move from one team to another. Do you feel like your brand managers, those guys who are bringing up those authentic brands in one location or another, are becoming interchangeable, able to move around the network and sort of, you know, develop? Develop and elevate your game everywhere, or, or do they pretty much stay in their places in their silos? Yeah, I think that's um, you know it's a, it's a very much what I consider a competitive advantage is in, in that our RVPs, you know, they they really do focus on their individual brands, and so they become subject matter experts. It's um it's not not unlike a, a corporate environment where you have a VP of IT who may know some things about operations, right, and he, and he understands the company culture. Um, but that's really where he focuses and provides the most value. And I think that that gives us a distinct advantage. Um, there are other organizations that because they're all the same across the board, you could take a, an operator here and put them into there. Right. Um, but I also think that they would also struggle with um, figuring out the, the culture of that city and understanding the nuances of that city. So I don't think it's unlike other organizations. I just think it's a competitive advantage because we, we are bringing these brands in. And, you know, most of the time, I would say almost all the time, we, we bring on the entire team that, that during the transition. So there's not like this mass exodus. So we have all this great intellectual property and knowledge. And then we're applying these operators who have you know, great historical knowledge in the business. And, and it seems to work. I got you. I got you. Well, let me ask you a question. These might be better for your VP marketing. I think it was Julie you had mentioned, um, but but let me just probe it for a second, just because our audience is so much um, creative operations, right? And so we think about sure, this. Yeah. Do you guys use a shared services model um, for creative production? I don't know, video production, so that uh, everybody's tapping into, you know, when, when they need to produce a commercial or they need to produce this or that. Are you using a shared services model or does all that creative stay out in the locations? No, no, no. We, um, we actually bring everything uh, in-house. We have individual vendors and partners uh, that we partner with. We tend to stay small and nimble, not big and bulky. So um, because we have so much change that happens in, in just our short time as a company. So, yeah, everything happens within house. So, you know, the company that does our 360 tours is the same one that does all of our brands. Our creative agency who, who helps us with all of our graphic design, et cetera, does all of our graphic design. And so what's awesome about that is that you have um, individuals that understand our brands and and so there's no um, there's no lost time t trying to get them to understand what the real essence of the brand is. And so we feel like it works really well. And um, Julie and her team, as we continue to grow and have other needs like video production, et cetera, we, we go out and find people that just do that. And then we bring them into the fold and into the family. Very few things happen individually uh, at the actual park level, except for the execution of what we're we're doing at the uh, at the corporate level. Well, the point I was going to make, and I didn't mean to speak over you there, was just so you guys have found 
that, that through a shared services model, you can achieve efficiencies. It sounds to me like those those vendors at headquarters have to be – this is a unique athletic skill set too. To be able to jump across 15 or 20 different brands, right, and to be able to do that seamlessly, same day, next day kind of responsiveness, that's a, that's a tall order. And once you've found it, you really want to hang on to that. And, and so it sounds to me like this team – uh, metaphor that we've been using, not just for the operators out there, but for the headquarters. Um, everybody has kind of a unique um, a role to play. And one I haven't seen, you know, replicated, uh, at least not in the conversations that we've been having here. Do you guys often find that uh, the folks in the field are sending in lots of requests and you're bottlenecking? Do, do you get that a lot? Yeah, we, yeah, so, um, you know, it's, we don't view it as a problem. We view it as a great opportunity, right? So our, our sales teams that are trying to do creative events, whether it's, um, and uh, brunch with the bunny request to, you know, to, to do something with Easter bunny or whether it's, um, uh, you know, a buy one, get one promotion at the operations level. Um, all of those things come in. We use a great tool called Basecamp and Basecamp, um, essentially is our creative marketing house where they come in, they submit their requests and then that gets pushed out to all of our creative teams to create that. It's uploaded into Basecamp. The, the salesperson or marketing person goes and grabs it. And so it's an incredibly efficient model because we're not going back and forth with emails. It's I put the request in. As soon as it gets dropped in there, they get notified. They go in and grab it. So it's a really plug and play model. And it keeps people moving and very efficient. Well, you know, it's a base camp, of course, you know, for all the folks out there in the audience who might not uh, know this um, somewhat ancient history. But base camp was a project management tool around which I think much of Agile you know, in the development world, first arose. And the fact that you guys have been using it, right, you're translating that notion of Agile into the creative world, the creative production world, is something we've seen happening maybe for the past decade. What it feels like to me is you guys have taken this to a level of art and system that is relatively rare. So it's really cool to hear. Um, and, you know, as a, a creative who got into development, uh, to see the development tools feeding their way back into, you know, the, the creative operations world and now finally doing so in a mature way it is awesome. So, uh, so that's, that's a really great story that you tell us. We're going to keep a close eye on you and, and we're going to come and bug you guys and ask Julie to join us on a podcast too. Cause I have a feeling you guys have learned a lot of lessons that the team out there, the, the audience would love to hear. So let me not take up more of your time. It was really great to hear from you, Troy. We really appreciate it. Uh, and everybody stay tuned for the next episode of the creative operations podcast 2.0. Thanks. Thanks.